Let's begin. Let's begin. Hello and welcome to Pods Above Replacement, part of the Padres Hot Tub Podcast Network. My name is Rafi Cantor. I am the producer of Padres Hot Tub and joining me from the Mile High City, he's sick of being compared to Fozzie Bear, it's John Fricota! Waka waka, Rafi, how's it going? Waka waka to you, John. That's right. We're burying the lead a little bit, but who cares? It's a celebratory day. We're covering the lead. Burying the lead, yes. You're also burying the lead. <laughs> Bur- uh, burying the lead as well. Oh, I missed it. It was right there. <laughs> it was a soft... Unlike Michael Walker's changeup, it was a softball that I could hit, uh, but I missed it. So that's right. We're doing Michael Walker today, uh, and the reason we're doing him is because he was the winner of our YouTube poll uh, where we asked some of our subscribers, who should we talk about next? Uh, very close vote, by the way, 31%. Plurality, not a majority, but uh, that wins. For, it's uh, first past the poll, first past the post. Is that what it's called? Anyway, uh, <laughs> in uh, in YouTube land. So if you want to get that poll, that's going to decide which Padre we're going to cover next on Pods Above Replacement. You can go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Padres Hot Tub. Uh, and by the time you're watching this, we will have a main Padres Hot Tub show episode on this YouTube channel as well. So you could subscribe there. It's a one-stop shop for both Padres Hot Tub and Pods Above Replacement. And uh, we're gonna be having more exclusive video content coming out. We're pumping out those YouTube shorts, working the algo, getting things popping. (laughs) And uh, of course, you can always have a deeper connection to Pods Above Replacement and this community by becoming a patron patreon.com slash Padres hot tub. John and I, uh, like we said last time on there, probably way too much, uh, but we have our own dedicated pods above replacement channel. I don't know about you, John, but I've, I've, uh, turned on notifications just for the pods above replacement channel so that I I can be, yeah, yeah, we want to look at that. We didn't even talk about that. We're in (laughs) synergy. We're in sync. We want to be ultra responsive to pods of replacement viewers and listeners. So uh, you can join us on there for as little as $5 a month, patreon.com slash Padres hot tub. So uh, like we mentioned, we're talking about Mr. Waka and a uh, very new Padre, a uh, longtime major league veteran. He was born on July 1st, 1991. So I believe this technically still makes it his age 31 season because I think the cutoff is June 30th. So uh, just by one day, mm-hmm. uh, Michael Walker is uh, in 2023 going to be playing in his age 31 season. He was drafted in 2012 by the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, first round pick, pick number 19 overall by the St. Louis Cardinals. And uh, his contract, again, this is one of those A.J. Preller specials that we've discussed before. Uh, we talked about it in the Nick Martinez episode. We're going to talk about it here. Uh, four years, $26 million guaranteed. Uh, that being said, the deal is a little more complicated than that. Uh, at the end of this year, uh, the Padres have the option to exercise a two-year $32 million club option. So we'd be paying him $16 million a year for 2024 and 2025. And I believe he'd be a free agent after that because that becomes the overriding contract. And if we decline to offer him that club option, Michael Walker would then have player options for $6.5 million at the end of every season from 2024 to 2026. It would take him through the 2026 season. So um, this is uh, what Fangraphs dubbed a risk reversal uh, strategy contract, which is, you know, an international banking finance term, which obviously there's a lot of crossover between baseball and those worlds, especially in the post moneyball era. But essentially what we're doing is we're buying each other's upsides and downsides. So uh, basically, if Michael Walker comes out and wins the Cy Young this year, I'm not saying that we think he's going to do that, but if he did, we would have him locked in at that two-year $16 million rate, even though he would fetch much, much more on the open market. That being said, if he comes in and is a bright and shiny turd uh, in the Padres rotation, uh, he's going to be guaranteed that $6.5 million a year for the next three seasons after this one. So uh, interesting contract structure. We'd expect nothing less from AJ Preller. Uh, So a little more about Michael Walker before we start talking about him as a pitcher. 
born in Iowa City, Iowa, and like any good Iowan, he grew up a fan of which team, John? That's the Hawkeyes. It's the Hawkeyes, unless you're uh, from Ames, I guess, because th- those Hawkeyes fans are, are rabid. I, I have a, a radiology attending who, just like two days ago, or Friday, so three days ago, taught a brainstem structure based on it looking like a Hawkeye. So there's some rabid fans out there. That runs deep, and also, it's not what I had in mind at all. I was asking about his Major League Baseball team. <laughs> oh, Major... Well, okay, I should have so, specified. Uh, no, you were right, though, because that's... I would... I think in a vacuum, I would have gone there. Uh, but, so the question is, the team... Like, people that live yes. there tend to tend to root for one team, and which team is it? Yes. Interesting. Yeah. It's I, There's not a lot of... There's not a lot of Iowa folk that are coming to Colorado, so it's not that. It's nothing in... I'm going to go with KC? Are they rooting for KC? It's a good guess. So the fun fact about Iowa is that it's the most blacked out state, according to MLB TV. It's in like five or six teams blackout areas, which is ridiculous because it's not actually not close to any one of them. But uh, he grew up a Cubs fan because the... Uh, Iowa Cubs is the AAA affiliate uh, uh, locate, located in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, it was a tough one, but uh, you got the Hawkeyes one right, so there, there you go. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so Waka, big boy. Turns out he's a big boy. Slender man, 6'5", 180 pounds in high school. Not only was an incredible baseball player, but was All-State in basketball growing up. Uh, but he ends up going to play college ball down south at Texas A&M. Their mascot is... Who, John? They're the Aggies. They're the Aggies. Yes, that went so much smoother. Uh, <laughs> three years that at Texas a- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, three years at Texas A&M. It doesn't have a ton of velo while he's down there. You know, when he got there as a freshman, apparently he was only throwing like 84 to 88. Uh, but, uh, you know, over those three years that he was there, he built up and built up. And his final season... He posted a 2.29 ERA and 129 innings pitched with 123 Ks and just 20 walks. So talk about efficiency. That was him, and it caught the attention of the St. Louis Cardinals. Now, an interesting thing about his draft slot, like I said, he was taken with the 19th overall pick. That slot originally belonged to the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim of Los Angeles. Uh, (laughs) But... They had to forfeit that pick and give it up to the Cardinals after they signed one Albert Pujols. Uh, so it's one of those things where, you know, not only was that contract uh, a giant goose egg for the Angels, but also uh, it has these downstream effects. And, you know, when you talk about teams having to give up qualifying offer picks and everything and why there's so much, you know, consternation about them, it's because they, you know, have these effects. So, um, once he was drafted by the Cardinals, really, really quick riser through the system. Like I said, he was drafted in 2012. So at this time, the draft is in the summer. So in 2012, he throws all of 21 innings in the minor leagues, five innings in rookie ball, eight innings in single A, and eight innings in double A. Uh, to 2013, he starts the year in triple A. So that was enough, apparently. Uh, so 84 innings in triple A, and he finishes the year with 64 innings pitched in MLB, including a playoff run, John. Yeah, I would have hit you up with this same trivia question, but this would be a very hard one. Um, So he ended up being the fourth rookie ever to win a postseason MVP honors. Uh, That was against the Dodgers in the NLCS. He had 13 and two-thirds scoreless innings. The other ones were Larry Sherry in the 1959 World Series, Mike Boddicker, in the 1983 NLCS, and then the one that maybe you could have possibly remembered was Levon Hernandez in the 1997 NLCS. That's a a quick rise. I I remember the Wainwright coming up against the Padres and immediately slotting in as like the closer for the St. Louis Cardinals, uh, like right away and making a postseason run. They're able to do that for some reason. Uh, Maybe uh, Adam Mazur, our second round pick last year, maybe maybe this year suddenly he's going to be being a playoff pitcher for us this year. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see indeed. I, I, by the way, I'm just, I was so hung up on Larry Sherry. I had to like go and Google it just because it's such a good baseball name. I, like, I just like Larry Sherry. I could just imagine like being said over like a crackly AM radio. Like, uh, that's so good. Anyway, uh, Michael Walker, 
uh, sporting quite the repertoire these days. Uh, he has a four-seamer, a change-up. Those are his two main pitches. We'll be talking mostly about those going forward. But uh, he also throws a cutter, a curveball, and a sinker. And he's a pitcher that's very much been in flux over the course of his career, John. Yeah, so he started off as mainly a fastball change-up pitcher, which is not surprising as a guy that immediately rose to the major leagues. And he had one really good pitch, his change-up, and then a fastball that he could use to provide deception for the change-up. But over time, he started to add some spin to balls and then a sinker as well. He said that in 2015, he added what he called was his cutter slider thing. Uh, on StatCast, it's measured as a cutter. He calls it a slider and then usually sometimes calls it a cutter slider thing. Um, so he was trying to spin balls a little bit better around 2015. He added a curveball as well or started to use it more often. And then... He said in 2020, that was the first time that he really tried to improve that breaking ball because he was too much of a two-pitch pitcher, that fastball and the changeup. And so what he had done at that time in 2020 was lower his arm angle a little bit, thinking that he could get more horizontal run on his slider cutter thing. Um, he calls it a slider. But as soon as he did that, the result ended up being that he was no longer able able to go over the top with his changeup, which is his best pitch. And as soon as you eliminate your best pitch, then everything else kind of falls to crap, you know? And so it turns out that 2020 was the first year that he actually like got into the analytics of things. So that was, that was his first experiment was lowering his arm slot. But then he also started to learn a little bit about how his fastball plays with his changeup. And he was trying to get or maximize the kind of ride on his four-seam fastball in order to make it a playable pitch that he could throw his dominant change off of. And then he started modifying his grip. He does like a, he calls it a modified circle changeup where it's more of like a claw than a complete circle. Um, but otherwise, he holds it basically like he'd hold a four-seam fastball. And he says that he does a couple things with it, which won't be listed on StatCast, but he, he basically gets two different pitch shapes off of his changeup. One being one with more vertical break and one being one with more horizontal break. Um, so basically, he's been a, a pitcher who has had a similar repertoire for his whole career. He's been around forever. Uh, when, you, when you put that he was only 31 years old, I was shocked. Like, I feel like I've seen him for, I mean, I have seen him for a decade, so I think that he'd be older than 31, but... He's, a, he's a still a relatively young guy. He's only a month older than Domingo Tapia, for you Domingo Tapia <laughs> fans. Yeah. But, but it's just interesting to see someone who's been along, around that long only recently started you know, using analytics to try to change his pitch shapes. So that's what he's been working on. And then he's always been kind of hunting, having some breaking ball that works really well. And he's always trying to improve his slider, especially because... A change of works really well against left-handed hitters. Sometimes it's not quite as effective against right-handed hitters. And a really good slider from the same arm angle against right-handed hitters would be very valuable. He's always working on it. He never has quite found uh, success in terms of anything, really, in terms of batted ball luck or, or whiff rates. And, but that was his, his project, he said, this past offseason. So early results don't show a, a tremendous change, but we'll see if he was able to change anything yeah you mentioned you're surprised he's so young but that's what happens when your minor league career is like a spit handshake and then they like bring you up to the majors you know what i mean uh so he definitely benefited from uh, a fast trip through the system in st louis so uh i want to talk a little bit about kind of that evolution of michael waka you, you obviously talked about the, uh, some of the stuff that came from a great Fangraphs piece that he did where he talked about how he was changing uh, himself. And the numbers kind of show a tale of two pitchers. So, uh, you know, when we, we mentioned when he got to college, he, he wasn't throwing super hard. He definitely built himself up because by the time he got to the majors in 2013, his fastball was sitting 94-95. And that was the case from to his rookie season 2013-2014 all the way through uh what is considered his quote-unquote best year in 2017 best being the fact that he put up the most war uh in that season 3.1 f4 so uh you know his rookie season which again was only 64 innings pitch 
but he threw his fastball 63.9% of the time. So he's just really relying on that pitch. And this changeup was 27.8% of the time. So, uh, you know, he had other pitches in his repertoire at that point, but his, the usage on them was negligible. He was basically a two pitch pitcher. And, during the stretch from 2014 to 2017, like I mentioned, his fastball is sitting 94, 95, but his changeup is sitting 86, 87. So um, that's not like terribly out of the ordinary, uh, you know, eight mile an hour or so difference. You know, I think that that's about average. Uh, but, you know, what we've seen in more recent years, and obviously this is now, you know, anywhere from seven to nine years ago, uh, in more recent years, but there's been more emphasis placed on, on putting that, that the delta between those two pitches and, and making it stronger. Now, that's always been something people have known, but I think there's just, uh, you know, more of a uh, increased focus on it with the spin rate revolution and everything as well. Um, one of the consistent things between uh, Michael Walker during that, those quote unquote prime years that he had was that he was always great at limiting the long ball. His home runs per nine were consistently less than one. Uh, during all of those years and I wanted to just kind of take a closer look into 2017 which I mentioned was his like I said best year if you're going by Fangraph's war um, 4.13 ERA so it goes to show you that if you're having it, if you're chewing up innings and spitting them out which he had 165 and two-thirds innings that year which is not a crazy workload but if you're just like wicked consistent it's still super valuable to a team you know over three three wins um Fangraph's wins are for pitchers are largely based around FIP. Uh, you know, we've talked about FIP before fielding independent pitching. It basically relies on walks, strikeouts and home runs to do the bulk of its calculations because it wants to take out the randomness that you have of balls that are put in play, which as we've discussed in the show are random. Uh, and so his FIP that year was 3.63, which is a very solid FIP and explains kind of why his war is so high on a, a relatively, you know, not small by any means innings pitch uh, workload, but, you know, it wasn't 165 innings for starters, not anything crazy. Um, one of the things that stood out from that year, his strikeouts per nine was a full tick higher than the surrounding years. He had a 8.58 K per nine, whereas he was usually averaging about seven and a half. And uh, something that I thought was interesting, he, he was still giving up uh, 264 batting average allowed, which, again, is not super high, but it's not for a three-plus win pitcher like crazy low. And you look a little bit closer and you see that his ground ball rate was a career-high 48%, which starts to kind of indicate the transition and the profile that uh, Michael Waka is starting to take on in his career. Uh, his walks per nine were below three. Again, very solid. And I wanted to contrast that with when things kind of went a little bit south. Because Michael Waka had a little bit of a journey. He was a very solid three, four starter for St. Louis uh, during his prime years. And then his last year in St. Louis, he kind of goes down the toilet. He's below replacement level. His home run per nine about doubles uh, to 1.85 in 2019, 2.38 in 2020 when he starts with the Mets, which I just wanted to point that out because Emilio Pagan, we all remember in 2021, was the Pagong year. His uh, home run per nine was 2.27 in that year. So, um, so in 2020, Michael Waga had a higher home run per nine than Emilio Pagan did in 2021. Um, but his walk rate climbs, and that's kind of the the big thing. Uh, you know, we talked about Michael Waka. His his velocity when he was younger was a little bit stronger. He has a pretty solid command. His stuff is never going to be Blake Snell level overpowering, right? Like he's that's just not who he is as a pitcher. He, he works well off of location. So when a location pitcher starts walking people, it means trouble. Um, but the bottom line when you really get down to it is that his fastball stopped being effective in those years. Um, you know, in 2017, like I said, his quote unquote best year, his expected Woba on his fastball was 337, uh, which is really respectable. You know, a fastball is going to be your, your, your most hit pitch, um, you know, pretty consistently. And a 337, while that's still above average is uh, for fastball, not a terrible number. Uh, in 2019, that climbed to 396, and in 2020, the ex-WOBA climbed to 436. So 
everyone's <laughs> basically Mike Trout against his fastball in 2020. So uh, when you're a fastball changeup pitcher, that is uh, not going to fly. So uh, Michael Waka again, tr- kind of travels around. He goes to plays in New York in 2020. He goes to Tampa Bay in 2021, uh, starts to see a little bit of a resurgence there. Obviously, Tampa Bay knows how to fix pitchers, and this is during the height of the spin rate uh, era slash controversy. And in 2022, he lands in Boston, and that's really where we start to see him embrace the profile of who he is today, which is embracing the finesse pitcher. Um, Michael Walker does not throw as hard as he did when he first came to the majors. He was touching 94, 95 when he came up here sitting 94, 95, really. Uh, and now he's sitting 92, 93, which in today's game is just not going to fly. Uh, when, like I said, when he came up, he was throwing his fastball 64% of the time. If you're throwing that same rate now on a 92, 93 pitch, you are not going to be a major league pitcher anymore. So, um, he starts to work in some more secondary pitches and you start to see him kind of embrace who he is, which is a location first pitcher pitcher. His case per nine drop 7.35, which you, you obviously don't necessarily want, like pitchers don't necessarily want like a, like a lower K for nine, but his walks drop precipitously. He's down to 2.19, which is very solid. And he starts to cut down on his home runs again, so 1.27 home runs per nine. And uh, what we kind of saw over those years is that he started throwing a sinker more and the sinker became a lot more effective. We see a lot of finesse pitchers, Kyle Hendricks, Zach Davies, those kind of people who are uh, effective at throwing a sinker to try and induce ground balls and uh, weak contact. So on his sinker, hitters had a launch angle of 10, which is not great, but it's definitely better than his fastball, which was up towards 20. Um, the exit velo was down to 87.9 and the X Woba was a 332, which again on a fastball type pitch is, is pretty decent. His, uh, ground ball rate, uh, climbs back up to 48%. And the most important thing I would say is that he can start throwing his fastball again. Um, the spin rate climbed 90 RPMs from where it was in 2019, which was again, his, his below replacement level year. In 2022, his spin rate was 20, 2,122 on his fastball compared to 2,032, uh, but the speed was exactly the same. So climbing that 90 RPM on the exact same velocity is going to add rise to your pitch. And why is that effective? Why do we want a fastball that rises? Because it tunnels well with a changeup. And like we said, Michael Walker has been a fastball changeup pitcher his, the entire time he's been in the league. And so in 2022, his fastball had a 1.5 inches of rise more than the average fastball in Major League Baseball. And if you compare that to 2019, his, his off year, it was only 0.6 inches. So it's a full inch above where he was throwing in that off year. And that made his changeup much more effective. And John, I know uh, you wanted to talk a little bit there about how he's uh, the type of pitcher that Michael Walker it is may contribute to him being quote unquote lucky. Yes, I do. But just to touch on something you were talking about a, a second ago, before I go into that is, so you were talking about tunneling and his forcing fastball ride and, uh, two seamer so he, he talked about that a little bit in that fangraphs article that i was talking about and so a couple of things on the open market when your stuff increases stuff over location gets money so you want your stuff to look good to like people that are analyzing you for, in order to get more money um and a sinker actually makes your change up a worse pitch because changeups are measured based on the difference from your primary pitch, which if your primary pitch is a sinker, the, the movement on a changeup and a sinker are similar. We'll talk about this a little bit more later and in future episodes because it's a little bit in depth, but he knew that. And so he added the sinker in spite of that because he said anecdotal, anecdotally that when he went to watch his teammates hit in the batting cages what they were working on was almost exclusively just four seamers at the top of the zone like riding fastballs and so he was like well my fastball is not going to play if all you're working on is hitting that fastball and i have one with a little bit more ride than normal but it's also you know 
not very fast, people are going to smoke that. So he does need that pitch in order to make his changeup as dominant as it can be. But he also needs to trick you a little bit. He needs you to know that that's not all he's going to throw you is that fastball and that changeup so that you can just sit on that fastball and smoke it when you get it. You have to at least know that there's other pitches in the in his repertoire to you know keep you guessing and he knows that and that's what he's working on and that's kind of why he said that he added that sinker okay but going into xera you you've painted a pretty picture of what happened last year and i can hear some of our fans out there saying yeah rafey he had a good year last year but did he really have a good year last year (laughs) because his his xera you will hear folks talk about this. His XERA was not the same as his ERA. His ERA was 332 and his XERA was 456. And we've discussed in the past that the expected uh, ERA is based on walks and hit by pitches. And instead of on the actual outcomes, the velocity and launch angle with which a pitch was hit, not necessarily the location. So he was giving up decently hard contact why was the ZRA lower? And the answer to that is that when folks were on base, and especially when they were in scoring position, they performed very poorly against him. You can say, oh, that's just luck, right? He's, he's getting very lucky in these important situations. But, but we know that psychology doesn't work quite that way. When, when you're in these tough, tight situations, you might change what you're doing a little bit, Right? or at least save your best pitches for when you're in these tight situations. And he did increase his changeup use a lot when runners were on base. It went up to be his primary pitch. He threw it more than 35% of the time in these scenarios in which folks were on base. And he killed with it. So with runners on score, in scoring position against his changeup, batters had a slash line of 132 batting average, 146 on base percentage and a 158 slugging percentage. So, I mean, pitchers don't hit like that. Nobody hits yeah. that poorly. That's yeah. those are that's a crazy slash line. And the ex-Wobo was just as bad. Just you can't you can't hit a changeup when there's runners in scoring position. He saves his best for last, right? But before you get all excited and say, "Oh, he's just teasing you until there's runners in scoring position," then he'll put you away. He did have some batted ball luck, some serious batted ball luck in run, with runners in scoring position against all other pitches. So when he wasn't throwing that changeup with runners in scoring position, he gave up a 311 Woba, which we've said in the past, 320 is about average. It's like a on-base percentage. But his expected Woba in those situations on all other pitches was 423, which is, like you said, Mike Troutish, right? And so... There was presumably some luck in those scenarios, unless he's just very good at getting you to hit it directly at his defenders, which he probably isn't. Most folks aren't. That being said, there, there is a little bit of hope that maybe that X ERA doesn't explain him much more than his ERA explains him. It might be that he is a veteran, a wily veteran out there who says, see if you can hit my fastball. If you can hit my fastball, then when runners are on are on base, I'm going to, you know, hunker down and start throwing you more change-ups, throwing you more junk in general, and seeing if I can't get a double play or get some weak contact or strike out. So that, that's, that's my, uh, uh, my thought process on kind of that, diff- that discrepancy that I'm, I'm sure that folks are concerned about. Certainly. So uh, Michael Walker, you know, now in 2023, small sample size, thus far uh but he appears to again be embracing this sort of finesse mentality uh he's throwing his fastball 34.3 percent of the time and so far he's only thrown it for 91.5 miles per hour again father time undefeated but uh he's throwing his change up all the way up to 31.5 percent of the time but one of the things i wanted to note is that his change up speed is down to 81 miles an hour so uh with his change up speed down about 10 miles an hour below his fastball again that's going to make those pitches a little bit more complementary towards one another um he's throwing that that cutter slider thing about 16 percent of the time and then working in a curveball and a sinker uh so yeah again i i I talked about this earlier 
his spin rates are great. His, you know, his, his changeup spin rate is dropping on his, uh, from his prime St. Louis years. His fastball spin rate's going up relative to miles per hour because, again, he's not throwing as hard. So when you're not throwing as hard, your spin rate's going to go down naturally. But if you're the ratio of your RPMs to mile per hour is either consistent or even going up, then you're going to be in somewhat okay shape. So, like I said, his spin rate is consistent or maybe even a little bit better on a ratio basis. Uh, but basically, Michael Walk is going to live and die by his fastball changeup combo. And, John, I know that we have some more advanced metrics that are available to us these days uh, to break down just what makes those pitches so effective. Yeah, so as many folks know, Stuff Plus came out on Fangraphs this year, and it's a hot topic, so I'm going to try to skirt that political line of how much I follow it, but we'll get into in future episodes a a deeper breakdown of Stuff Plus and what goes into it. It is proprietary, so I don't know exactly what goes into it, but they've released at least the factors that they're looking into, or at least most of them, and those are... The release point, the velocity, the vertical and horizontal movement on a pitch, the spin rate. There's also the maybe someday in the in the future we'll talk about seam shifted wake, which is a little bit more in depth. So what? The what? The what? Seam shifted shifted wake, you say? Yeah. So that'll be you know you can start practicing your physics for your physics exam. You can listen to pods above replacement in order to get your physics. But <laughs> we, we, we certainly won't cover that now. We'll probably, I would imagine we probably do it in shorts because it's a very visual uh, thing. But so Stuff Plus, there is a difference on, in Stuff Plus between fastballs, breaking balls, and what they denote as off-speed pitches, off-speed pitches being changeups and splitters. And the reason why is because they imagine off-speed pitches as being dictated by the primary pitch, right? Which is normally a fastball. And the way that they rate it is based on how that pitch deviates from your primary pitch. So it is an off-speed pitch. It is, there's, a, there's a deceptive aspect to it. But if your fastball is exactly the same as your changeup in terms of shape and it doesn't have a lot of change in, in uh, velocity – then you can throw the nastiest changeup ever, but people can just kind of sit on that shape and that speed because your fastball is not going to be much different. So what pitchers are trying to do, especially in the last few years, is make sure that their fastball, usually a forcing fastball, because like I said, it probably makes them more money if they have a huge discrepancy between their forcing fastball and their changeup, is different. And so the average, you, you kind of touched on this, and you were right, the average fastball change up discrepancy or fastball off-speed pitch discrepancy because splitters are also considered an off-speed pitch. They're basically like a fancy change up, right? Has eight miles per hour of a, of a discrepancy in velocity. And then eight inches of drop relative to a fastball and three and a half inches of arm side run relative to a fastball. And that's good, right? You, you want to have a pitch that hits the top of the zone or wherever you want to locate your fastball and then another pitch that breaks off of it and is slow so you can't have your bat in the same place and you can't have your bat at the same velocity in order to hit the the change up because it's just a completely different pitch it looks the same but it's going to end up in a wildly different place with a wildly different rate at which it crosses the strike zone so that's how they evaluate stuff plus change ups largely based on your fastball and how much it deviates off of it and like I said, Michael Walker has been playing around with his changeup. It's always been good. Always had great results on it. But it does seem as though this offseason, he made a little bit of a change to the shape. And I had said earlier in the, in the, in the episode that he can kind of choose whether he gets more vertical drop or horizontal drop, depending on how he's throwing it. It's usually based on his pronation. He, this year, has had a lot more vertical drop. And he's also had a lot more of a, of a discrepancy, like you were talking about with his changeup. So now it's like 10 miles an hour different in terms of velocity, and it has much more vertical drop than it has in, in years past, at least on average. So now it's about five inches of 
extra drop, which is a lot of extra drop. And so far, it's performing very well in 2023. His whiff rate is up. Everything is just better on it in 2023. And not only that, but that's something that folks know that you should be trying to do in the event that you want your stuff plus rating on a changeup to go up. So I'd imagine he knows a little bit about the, the, the fact that this is happening and like he probably wants that number to be you know, a higher drop because you can have a higher stuff plus rating, whether stuff plus is true or not, or like how valuable it is, is a question mark. But I can tell you that it's very likely that if you get that number up, folks are gonna be willing to pay you more. Um, so, I mean, it's a, it's a good, it's just a good move to make your pitch have a little bit more of a, of a drop on your changeup and a wider velocity discrepancy. So just to put some numbers to it, like I said, he's always had a, a great stuff or a great changeup. Stuff Plus rated him as having a 103 Stuff Plus without getting too much into it. That just means 3% above average on his changeup, which doesn't seem right because his results were much better than 3% above average on his changeup. But either way, that's what they rated it as was 103. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, John, but Stuff Plus doesn't necessarily take into account results. It just takes into account the physical characteristics of the pitch, right? Correct. So it, yeah. it doesn't take into account results at all. It's just the physical. Yeah. So you have that exactly right. However, you would expect over a large enough sample size, if you had a certain quality of pitch, that it would get that quality of pitches, typical results. You would and expect. His, but yeah. remember, baseball is stupid. And <laughs> no one should watch. So anyway, that, continue. That's true. <laughs> that's true. But anyways, the, the point is that he added those extra five inches of, of drop on his changeup this year, and Stuff Plus loved it. They put, they put him as having a, so far this year, a 123, was it? Yeah, 123 yeah. Stuff Plus changeup so far, which is 23% above average. I don't even know because changeups are, they get, they're rated as worse than average on average as a pitch. But either way, 123 uh, Stuff Plus. And just to compare that to other pitchers in the league last year, that would be the second best stuff plus changeup among starting pitchers behind only Sandy Alcantara. And up there with, so Sandy Alcantara had a 130 stuff plus. People that are known for their famously disgusting changeups are like Jason Adam, who had incredible results last year. He had a 128 stuff plus on his changeup. And then. A pitch that ha is so good that it has a name for it, the Airbender by Devin Williams, that so good it has a name. Like, there's not that many pitches that have a name. That was a 113 stuff plus changeup while being a reliever, which all your stuff normally goes up when you're out of the bullpen. And so Waka has, so far this year, put up a, a stuff plus rating on his changeup that's better than the Airbender. Once again... I don't necessarily agree that it is the better pitch than the Airbender. I, in fact, I just will tell you right now, I don't believe that it's the better pitch than the Airbender. But, but it's, it's, it's putting up numbers that say that it's very good. And it probably is a better pitch than it was even last year just because of the, the discrepancy in the speed off of his fastball as well as the increased movement. And it's been show, it's showed so far. He's been his K rates have been way up, and his whiff rates on his changeup have been great so far. So that's something that's just something to look forward to. I think is let's just see how that changeup plays because it's always been a great pitch for him. As recently as 2020, he was like experimenting with arm angles and and stuff. So like he's still learning clearly. Yeah. And right now he right now he's learning that his changeup is very good, and that's why he's increasing its usage. And he's trying to make it even better. And the better your best pitch is, the harder everything else becomes. Because now you have to look out for that changeup. And it's going to be hard to hit even a 91-mile-an-hour fastball with ride if you're looking for a changeup that's breaking wildly different than that forcing fastball that you expect. And then you still have to at least watch out for the cutter slider pitch, the curveball, the sinker. So that, that's, the, that's the exciting part about, like, let's see – Maybe he's adding uh, a skill to his skill set, which he was already a... It'd be hard to argue that he's not a back-of-the-rotation type starter. You know what I mean? He, he's. It'd be hard to argue that he's not at least like a number four or five starter. 
if that changeup gets better and he's suddenly his whiff rate is going up and everybody's scared of the changeup and all the other pitches look more difficult because of that, maybe he's a little bit, you know, maybe he's a, a number three starter. Something that's more valuable than his contract for sure. So with that in mind, John, you, you mentioned it's hard to say he's not a back rotation starter. We, we definitely don't think that he throws a better changeup than Devin Williams, even though in the outset mm-hmm. so far, uh, some of the numbers point to that. So, so who, is, who is he? Who is Michael Waka based on everything we've said? Yeah, I, I think that he is that back of the rotation starter with a little bit of upside. He is somebody who gets hit hard at times. He has literally never had a barrel rate above the 41st percentile. And most of the time, like so the percentage of barrels that he's giving up are normally in the like 30th or lower percent of the league. He gives up a lot of barrels, gives up a lot of hard contact, gives up a lot of home runs. But what he does is he follows Mama's advice. And Mama's advice, as you remember, are that alligators are ornery because they got all them teeth and no toothbrush, and that walks are the devil. And he does not walk anybody. If you're gonna beat him, you have to beat him by getting hits. And getting a hit in the major leagues is hard to do. We talked about this, I think it was in the Trent Grisham episode, that driveline basically just says, hitters shouldn't swing. They should swing very, very seldom because most of the time you're better off just taking a pitch just because if you get a walk, that's such a positive event. And it's really hard to hit a major league baseball. If you put it in play, you can put it in play with even a barrel and there's a great chance that the, that barrel is now. So he learned that. It seems like he learned it in about the year 2019 as soon as he started to get into the analytics because his, his walk rate went from very mediocre to like in the 20th percentile-ish range to suddenly the 93rd percentile where he just said, nobody's walking. You're If you want to get on base, you're going to hit your way aboard. And that's just true. It's just, a, it's just a good strategy in general to have. Most of the great pitchers in the league have it. If you want to beat me, you have to beat me on a pitch in the zone or slightly off the zone because I'm not going to give you a walk. There's pitchers that have made basically a whole career off of it. And for example, Zach Grinke last year, had a 3.68 ERA, he had a 4.8 Ks per nine, which, which is like half of yeah. league average. Yeah. 4.8 Ks per nine. And basically all he did was say, I'm not going to walk you though. And so folks just, you know, put up a, you know, mid threes ERA because it's hard to hit a major league baseball. It just is. And so Michael Walk is going to give us that. He's going to give us not a lot of walks, and so you're going to have to beat him by hitting you know, a baseball sometimes three, four times in play where a fielder is not just to get one run. And sometimes you'll hit a homer, but apparently when there's runners on base, he'll say, I'm going to make it harder on you because I'm going to be throwing you a lot of change-ups, and folks are performing worse against his change-up. So that, that seems to be a strategy overall. And like, like I said, he gives up the barrels. He gives up the homers. He's one of, he's one of the worst in the league, honestly, in giving up barrels. In the past, since 2015 started recording, he's 15th worst in the league in giving up barrels. And you might say, yeah, but that just indicates longevity. In reality, he doesn't pitch that much. Like, he gets hurt a fair amount. (laughs) So Uh so he's just getting getting barreled. He's getting barreled at the 38th highest rate among pitchers that have pitched a significant amount of innings. So he's getting barreled. That, That will happen. But never on his changeup. His changeup like almost never gets barreled. It's, it gets barreled at a 0.3% rate. So, you know, you have a runner on second base and I'm going mostly changeups. There's a very low percent chance that you get a big hit off me at least. And so that's, that's kind of his strategy. And I think it's a fairly good one for an end of the rotation starter. You have one really good pitch and you can throw other pitches off of it. So if anybody's looking for one pitch in particular, they're not going to be able to play that game. And then you're going to have to beat me. Like if, if you want to beat me, you're going to have to beat me. And you're probably going to have to beat me on a changeup with runners in scoring position if you want to beat me. And that's not going to be easy. So he, he, his career, he seems as though he's gotten – he's changed his game a few times. And it seems as though he's only getting smarter. He's only getting more uh, well-versed in the knowledge that is presented to him. I think that, yeah, that, that – floor is a number four starter number five starter in our rotation and then the ceiling is maybe that changeup gets a little bit better maybe he's more of a number three pitcher so that kind of brings us to the end of our episode and 
because Michael Walker is not a arbitration candidate, you know, we can't really do our usual marry, fuck, kill of, you know, use him while he's cheap, trade him away, sign him to an extension. He is locked in to that risk reversal contract we talked about where he's going to be paid at least six and a half million. And after this year, the Padres could choose to pay him $16 million for the next two years. So um, I'll start us off and just kind of talk about what I think we should be doing going forward. These are our way too early projections uh, for what we think. And then I'll kick it over to you to, to close things out. But um, I think there's a really easy way to look at whether or not the Padres should up exercise this club option, uh, which is, do they think that he's going to be worth two war per year over the next two years? Uh, Michael Walker, like we said, his club option for the Padres is going to be uh, $16 million a year for the next two seasons. And they would need to make that decision at the end of the 2023 season. And uh, on a dollar per war basis, you know, somewhere in the eight, $9 million range per win is about what we see these days. You know, after last year's kind of crazy free agent market, uh, you know, that number can fluctuate quite a bit. Uh, but on the open market, and especially for a pitcher of his profile, a little bit older, not like a super stuff heavy guy, I wouldn't expect too much deviation from those numbers. So the question becomes, do we think Michael Waka has it in the tank that he could be worth four war over the next two years. And, uh, you know, it, that might, two wins a year might not sound like a lot, but he hasn't done it since 2017. Uh, and I don't think he's going to do it again. Uh, you know, I think he's gotten off to a, a hot start and I'm really excited about the potential that he holds and I hope I'm wrong. Uh, but the honest answer is, is that this contract was structured the way it was structured for a reason. It's because there's a good chance he's not worth the $16 million a year. And there's also a good chance that he's not worth less than the six and a half million that we'd be paying him if he exercises his player option. He's probably going to be worth somewhere in the middle. Um, I, I definitely see a situation where he decides to opt out from his six and a half million dollars and maybe try and get $10 million a year, uh, similar to what Nick Martinez did. He had almost exactly the same terms on his contract, by the way. He's going to be paid about $7 million this year. He opted out, and he signed an extension that got him three years guaranteed at $10 million a year around there. So, uh, you know, there's no reason that I don't think Michael Walker couldn't be a Padre uh, in 2024, but uh, I don't think it's going to be under these contract terms. I think he's going to opt out of his player option and try and sign a different deal either here or elsewhere and if he does that means we got exactly out of michael walker what he wanted if he opts into his player option for six and a half million dollars he had a no good very bad season for us and we should be praying that he opts out uh so i always want to remind people that especially when the end of the year comes and everyone is cursing aj peller's name and saying why 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 did he create this super player friendly option and and it's so spooky that he could opt out it's so scary it's this is this is what you want you want players to opt out when they're in a performance-based situation it means that they gave you what you wanted you know so uh with that in mind john uh what should we be doing with michael waka so as you said last year he had he, what would i would consider almost a magical season in that he yeah. put up a 332 era over 127 innings and you put that on the table for me take it i'll take it already take it already took it that's a great outcome, I think, and he still had a 1.5 F war, and that's because FIP is in there, but still, like he had a, a good year, and it was still pretty mediocre. He didn't cross that two-war threshold, and then we'd have to expect him to get the two-war twice, not just once. I, I don't think that it's impossible that he is worth that. I think it's unlikely. I certainly do. But even if it were like a 50-50 proposition and that makes it, you know, fairly valuable in order to re resign that and at least know you got somebody at the end of the rotation that like we'll put up a round two war, I still am not convinced that I like his, how he works for our team during our current window. And the reason why that is is he – Yes, he provides end of the rotation uh, depth, you know. Not not really a lot of innings. Since 2017, he hasn't had more than 127, which I like innings for our team, you know, just for a conservative measure. 
and because we can outslug you. So if you're giving us, you know, even okay innings, we could probably outslug most teams. But also how I imagine he converts to the bullpen. I think we're a playoff team. I think we're going to be a playoff team for the next couple years. And he doesn't have the same ability to transfer into the bullpen during a playoff run, during like an actual playoff game, that Nick Martinez and Seth Lugo we know do. And it, it could possibly be the case that he does, but he hasn't proven it. And Nick Martinez and Seth Lugo have. Also, I have a little bit of maybe PTSD about how Melvin used Sean Mania and Mike Clevenger last year in the playoffs. He basically said, these guys got us here, so we're going to use them in a situation that probably every number that you could possibly look at would say a bullpen day is probably the best thing to do right now. He used Mania and Clevenger, and they just got smoked in a very important game in the playoffs. And I could see Melvin saying... Walker had a great year for us. He had a, like a 3.5 ERA. He was, you know, valuable for us getting to the playoffs in the year. I'm going to go with the person that brought me, right? But I could see that that backfiring. Like maybe you could say he could use his best pitches, his fastball changeup, really heavy on his changeup pitches during the, like a a time through the order in the playoffs. But as soon as you get to that fourth, fifth inning and he's Put up. He's only given up one run or zero runs. Do you stick with him? Probably you should take him out, and he's not going to get the win in the playoffs, which he probably wants, and Bo Mel probably wants him to get. I could see that backfiring, and I, I just don't like that even being an option. I like, I like him going into the playoffs and saying, here are our studs. We're going to use our studs, and when we're not using our studs, we're going to have a bullpen game, and everybody's going to give their damn best for an inning or two, sometimes three innings at best, and then they're going to get pulled. And you have enough innings in the playoffs to do that with three good starters and a few guys that can go multiple innings. That's what I expect out of the playoffs, but I also see why he might make the alternative decision. And that's something I'm not excited about. Well, uh, I just have a couple words for you, John. Waka waka. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that brings us to the end of what was a very informative episode of Pods Above Replacement. Really eager to watch and see how Michael Walker develops for us during the course of this year. Uh, Who do you want us to cover next? We talked about it at the beginning of the episode. We will be putting up a poll on YouTube after this episode drops, and the only way you can be guaranteed to get this poll is if you subscribe to our YouTube. Subscribe at Padres Hot Tub on YouTube. Once again, the main show will be up by the time... Go click on this. Go click on the main show now. It's okay. We won't be offended. (laughs) But stick around for the next 30 seconds, okay? Because uh, we also wanted to remind you, of course, to... Hit up John and I on our Patreon, on our Discord, patreon.com slash Padres Hot Tub. As little as $5 a month. We'll be talking on there all week uh, about this episode and who we're going to cover next and uh, and chatting it up over there. And John, did you have something else for us? Yeah, just that we're, we're learning pitch overlays and they're going to be sick. I think that you should check them out. It's, it's going to be content only on YouTube that are... I think very valuable because we can do them with all of our pitchers, just how they've changed their repertoire, how they're currently using their pitches, how they tunnel with one another. I think that it's valuable information if we're going to put a lot of work into it. So if you want to see it, come subscribe on YouTube. Yes, yes. Those pitching overlays, again, if you if you follow someone like uh, Pitching Ninja on Twitter, that's kind of what he's become famous for, uh, creating those. John and I now have the power. So we will be exploiting that, uh, the final stone on our uh, Infinity. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't watch Avengers, but, you know, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, a it's, it's a gauntlet. It's a gauntlet. Infinity gauntlets. Thank you so much. Okay. We are inevitable. I know the memes. Uh, but uh, so <laughs> with that being said, Uh, vote on our YouTube poll for who we're going to cover next. And otherwise we'll be back next week with a, another episode of pods above replacement. That will be during Tatis week, a very exciting time. Can, you know, Merry Tatis week to all who celebrate. So, uh, for John Percota, I'm Rafi Cantor. Thanks again for tuning in once more to pods above replacement.